Hello, and welcome to your first Recurrent Neural Networks lecture. In the previous section of lectures, we talked a little bit about convolutional architectures in deep neural networks. Convolutional architectures allowed us to take into account spatial relationships in data, like images. In convolutional layers, we take filters or kernels and we slid them across a 2D image, allowing us to model the 2D relationships or spatial relationships in the data. But another type of data that we might have and that we might want to model with a neural network is sequential data. Similar to data like images that has spatial relationships, sequential data has sequential relationships, meaning that as we go from one side of a sequence to the other, there's meaningful relationships there. For example, you might think of something like a time series, like the stock price each day across time. Unlike data that we used in convolutional neural networks that had spatial relationships, this has one-dimensional or temporal relationships. Basically, the relationships that we're modeling in the data happen across time. And sequential data is probably very familiar to you. For example, I just mentioned that things like stock prices over time, that's sequential data. Also, a lot of sensor data. Think about all of the things you wear, like an Apple Watch that's measuring your heart rate or your steps. And lastly, written text is sequential. When we read or write or talk, all of the words that we're saying have a meaningful order in a sequence. The first word can't suddenly jump to the middle of a sentence and have everything still make sense. And so with sequential data all around us, it makes sense that we may want to model some of this data using neural networks. Now, what are some things that we might want to do with sequential data? Well, the first and most common and obvious one is to do something called forecasting. Forecasting is when we look at a time series or a sequence of data over time, and we try and predict what the next time point will be. For example, we could predict what the price of Apple stock is going to be 10 days from now. Next, we might want to take a sequence and classify it. For instance, we could take in a string of text and try and see if we can classify who the author of that text is. Another thing we might want to do is something you might be really familiar with, which is machine translation. For example, we might want to translate one sequence, like a sentence, into another sequence, like that same sentence in a different language. We also might want to do anomaly detection, where we're looking at a sequence and seeing if there's anything that happened out of the ordinary. We can also summarize data. For instance, if you take a huge chunk of text and want a couple of sentences summarizing the information in that text. And the last example we'll talk about now is sequence generation. For example, imagine a model where we could feed it in all of Jane Austen's work and then ask it to generate a new chapter of a Jane Austen book. And these are all really interesting things that we could do, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the model architectures we might try in order to do some of these. The first thing we might try and do is just throw everything in a feed-forward neural network. Why not try it? It might at least provide us with a good baseline. We can take our sequence, flatten it, and just shove it through all of those layers. And honestly, sometimes this might work just in the same way that we used a feed-forward neural network to classify image data using the MNIST dataset. However, this type of model doesn't consider time-based relationships in the input data that we have. Therefore, we're sort of just throwing away information. If we have sequential data, say the price of a stock over time, we know that there are meaningful time-based relationships there. For instance, the price of a stock yesterday tells us a lot about what the price of a stock might be today. Okay, so we want to take into account these sequential relationships. Well, why not just do that with convolutional layers? Well, actually we can. We so far have been using 2D convolutional filters because typically what we're using is something like an image that is two-dimensional, but there's nothing stopping us from using one-dimensional convolutional layers in order to process a sequence. Just like with typical convolutional neural networks, we are taking filters and applying them to input, but instead of two-dimensional filters and two-dimensional input, we now have one-dimensional filters and one-dimensional input. And just like before, we take those filters, slide them across our data, and as we do, we will take the filter values, multiply them by the input values, and get out our output. For example, here we have the filter negative 1, 2, 
negative one. And the first time that we put this filter on our input data, we are gonna take the filter and multiply it by these three numbers here, resulting in the output of five. And we'll repeat this process until we get to the end of the sequence, giving us our final output. Because our filters are looking at chunks of the sequence together, we're not throwing away all of that sequential information that we were when we were using a feed-forward neural network. And just like with our typical convolutional networks, we often have multiple filters so they can detect different features about our sequence. And just like before, we can also use max pooling in order to downsample our information. For instance, here I have a two by one filter that's gonna slide across our sequence and return whatever the maximum value from that filter is. You can see that at the first placement, the maximum value is five, and so that's what the filter returns. Then four, then three, then six, then six again, and finally two. We could also use average pooling, which like max pooling slides a filter across our sequence, but instead of returning the maximum value, we return the average value, thus sort of smoothing out our sequence. And while it makes sense that we can use this architecture to process sequential data, 1D convolutional and pooling layers are typically not our go-to for modeling this type of data. Like when we're processing images, the filters we're using in these 1D convolutional layers assume translational invariance. And while that's true for images, that's not always true for sequences. Also, pooling, which we often pair with our convolutional layers, can interfere with the sequential information in our data. So while well, this is an improvement from feed-forward neural networks where we just completely disregard any relationship between our inputs, we can do better. And the way we can do better is with recurrent architectures. A recurrent neural network is one where the output at a certain time point is then fed back into the input for the next time point. In other words, the predicted price for tomorrow is going to affect what our predicted price of a stock is for the following day. And typically we represent recurrent neural networks using a diagram like this, which basically shows that we have an input and an output but that output is also then fed back into the model for the next time step. And if we remove that pesky recurrent connection, then this just looks like a typical feed-forward neural network. We have an input, we have an output, and we do some matrix algebra in the middle to get from one to the other. All we're doing with a recurrent architecture is we're having this loop that allows us to take previous outputs at different time points and feed them back into our model. Thus, this takes into account the time-based or sequential relationships in our data very well. And this will continue to happen over and over as we feed new data in, get a new output, feed that back into the model, use that to make a new output, feed that back in, new output, feed that back in. It creates this general loop for the entirety of our sequence. For this reason, we often also show our recurring architectures unrolled, which basically means we're just taking that diagram we saw previously and we're showing how it would look unrolled over time. For instance, here we can see that our input is generating an output, which is then fed into the next node, which also takes an input and generates an output, which is then fed into the next node, which also takes an input, generates an output, so on and so forth for the entire sequence until we get our final prediction, which is the last output. For example, we could feed this neural network five days worth of stock prices and then ask it at the end to output its prediction for what the following day's price would be. All right, so now you know how recurrent architecture works generally. Let's take a little bit of a look at what's happening under the hood and how we're generating these values. So the outputs of our model are called hidden states, represented here in these orange squares by H. We want to get the current hidden state, and in order to do so, we need at least two things. We need the actual input for our current time point, say the stock price for that day, and we need the hidden state from the previous node. Then all we need to do is combine this input and the previous hidden state by using weights and biases that our model is going to learn. Here you can see we take some weights and multiply it by our input plus some weights multiplied by our previous hidden state and then of course all of that added to a bias. This value is then fed through a hyperbolic tangent function, which if you remember from one of our earlier lectures, takes values and squishes them between negative one and positive one. The output of this hyperbolic tan is then our current hidden state, which we will then either use to make a prediction or feed into the next node. 
And just a quick update to notation for when we get to some more complicated networks. Oftentimes what we'll do is we'll take our previous hidden state and our current input and we'll squish them into a single vector and that way we only have one set of weights and we multiply it by this concatenated vector of both our hidden state and our actual input. And this is an example of what our simple recurrent neural network will look like unrolled. We start with a blank hidden state, we have our first input, and that gives us our next hidden state, which is then outputted but also fed in to the next node. We then combine that with the next day's input and get our new hidden state, and again and again until the very end of the sequence where we can make a prediction. For example, if we wanted to use this to predict stock prices, we could feed in the day zero stock prices, the day one stock prices, the day two stock prices, dot, 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 all the way until day eight. And then after we've fed that sequence through the recurrent neural network, we can then ask it, well, what's your prediction for day nine? Thus, the recurrent neural network has taken into account the sequential information in the data when making that final prediction. Now, even though I'm showing this network unrolled like this, where it sort of looks like there's multiple nodes chained together, remember, this is just a repeated copy of the same exact node. That means that every time our data is pushed through this node with input previous hidden state and then combined using our weights and biases, these are the same weights and biases that are being used at every single step. Just to repeat that, that means that this node that we have that we continuously send our data through is the same exact node, meaning that when we update these weights and biases, we're just updating this set of weights and biases. There's not one set of weights and biases per step in the sequence. To review, recurrent architectures are very special because they allow us to take into account sequential relationships in our data. The way they do that is by forming a node that takes in an input and a previous output, if there is one, and combining them to make our new prediction. Thus, when we have a sequence of data, we can feed it through this same node over and over and over, always taking the output of our previous time step and feeding it back in for the next one. And this type of architecture is especially helpful for things like forecasting, where we want to predict the next day's stock price, or your heart rate in 10 minutes, or the next word in a sentence. But for some sequential tasks, we actually want to approach the problem from both sides. For instance, in forecasting, we can't use future data to predict what tomorrow's stock prices are. But if we're doing a task like, say, trying to fill in the blank of a sentence like this one where it says the quick brown blank jumped over the lazy dog, we might want to actually attack this problem from both sides by processing our sequence both forward and backward and then combining that information. This is exactly what a bidirectional recurrent neural network does. It basically takes that recurrent neural network architecture that we talked about, and it does it once for going forward through the sequence from the quick all the way to lazy dog, and then it does the same thing for the sequence going backwards, so going from dog all the way to the. At each time step, it combines the output from the forward sequence and the backward sequence so that we can, quite literally, look at this problem from both sides. In cases like this, where we do have data both before and after the blank that we're trying to predict, this can be incredibly helpful to consider context from both before and after the word. Here's another example of a bidirectional recurrent neural network using a slightly more complicated model that we'll cover in the next lecture. To review, we talked about sequential data today. This could be things like stock prices, your biometric data measured by a smartwatch, or even sentences and text. Like the way that images had spatial relationships, sequential data has sequential or temporal relationships. And so when we're building models that try and use sequential data, we may want to take those into account. First, we just tried to brute force it and we shoved all of our data into a feed forward neural network, but we realized that that doesn't take into account the sequential relationships in the data and therefore is just kind of throwing all of that useful information away. Next, we tried to adapt convolutional architectures in order to fit this sequential data problem, and this did a lot better. 
By using one-dimensional convolutional filters, we were able to actually process our data while taking the surrounding data, say yesterday's stock prices and tomorrow's stock prices, into account. Thus, we introduced recurrent architecture. Recurrent architectures are similar to feed-forward architectures, although we take the output at a specific time point and we feed that back into the model. Thus, when we make a prediction for today, we're also taking into account what our prediction for yesterday was, and so on and so forth throughout the entire sequence. Because we're often taking our outputs and feeding it back in at the next time step, sometimes we show recurrent neural networks unrolled, meaning we show the same node repeated over and over across a sequence. Lastly, we learned that recurrent neural networks typically process our data from the beginning of the sequence to the end. However, sometimes we might have an occasion where we want to process sequences from both sides, first going forward and then going backward. In order to do this, we can basically combine two recurrent neural networks, one that processes a sequence forwards and one that processes it backwards. Then we combine their output in order to do things like, for instance, predict what a blank should be in a fill-in-the-blank. All right, that's all I have for you. I will see you next time.